This is the first in a series of lectures that's going to cover the very basics of research design. And in particular, for the moment, we're primarily going to focus on experimental design, with the understanding that we've also talked about the distinction between true experiments and quasi-experimental methods. This first lecture is going to introduce some very basic principles, talking about things like validity, control, and confounds. These are things we've talked about a little bit in class and in the course of discussing different uh, research examples in class. Okay, but what I want to do now is to sort of lay out some of these basic principles and, and cover the things that are also addressed in your textbook in chapter 9, pages 229 to 243 primarily. Now what we really want to do when we are designing an effective research study, and that's really what we're talking about here, okay? that's really the focus, the, the goal of these lectures, is not just going to be to introduce the material and the terminology, and that's really what a lot of the textbook is for, but really the focus here is again going to be how can we design an effective research study, how can we design a better study that's going to allow us to draw the conclusions we want to draw about human behavior. And that involves a few things. First of all, we need to understand the very basics of experimental logic, okay? and that goes just like this. If the only difference between two situations is some factor, x, and we find that the measure is different across these two different situations, then it must be due to this factor x that we've manipulated. Now, in other words, what that means is we're going to try and create a situation where, for now, let's consider two group comparisons. And if we have these two different situations, and there's only one key difference between these two situations, then to the extent that human behavior is different across those two situations, then we're going to infer, we're going to be able to use good logical reasoning and say that, well, the reason the behavior is different must be due to this one thing that's different between the two situations. That's really all an experiment is trying to do, and that's what it's really all about. However, what that requires us is to make sure that, indeed, there is only this one difference between the two situations, the variable x in which we're interested. Now, in order to ensure that that's the only difference between the two conditions, we need to make sure that we have control over just about every other, situ every other factor that's going to be occurring in the experiment. Some of them we may think about, and some of them we may not have thought about beforehand. And so that's going to be the important thing to realize. So when we talk about confounds in an experiment, what we're really talking about are some of these uncontrolled extraneous variables or flaws in the way that we might have designed an experiment that are going to lead to the possibility, or introduce the possibility, of some alternate explanation for differences in behavior that we've observed. In other words, something that's going to compromise the integrity of saying that it's just variable x, just this one difference between the two situations, that is producing whatever effect that we're observing. Now, this doesn't have to be the case. It's important to understand that even if there is a potential confound in your design, or you identify that there are potentially other factors or alternate explanations, that doesn't necessarily mean you have to throw out all your data and start over. Okay, the point here then is that even if you identify potential confounds, even though that means that that could compromise the logical inferences that you can draw, that's not a necessity. Okay, so in other words, it's not a foregone conclusion that everything's ruined just because there are potential confounding factors. Let's think about an example. So suppose you're interested in whether music affects performance. So you think that you've designed a good experiment to test this, and what you do is you bring a group of participants into the lab. So you bring in 10 participants at a time. And you randomly assign them to one of two study conditions. Okay, so you have all the 10 people sit down in front of a computer. Okay, and then you randomly assign five of them to each of these two different conditions. For the first half, as soon as the study period begins, you have them put on a pair of headphones, and you turn on a streaming online radio station that starts playing jazz music. Now the other half of the people simply study words presented on the computer screens once the period begins. Okay, so your experiment is such that you begin with words presented on a screen that is a study period of, let's say, three minutes, and then what you do is you give them a break, and then you give the participants a recall test of one minute where they have to try and recall as many words as they can that were on the study list that were on the screen during those first three minutes. Then what you have is during that study period, as soon as the study period begins, you tell half of the participants, give them instructions on their computer screen, for example, that tells them to put on a pair of headphones, at which point uh, the music starts streaming. And the other half of the participants don't put on the headphones and they don't listen to the music at all. 
Now your intention again here is to make the only difference between these two groups whether or not they're hearing the music. And if so, and they have better recall of the words, then you're going to draw the conclusion that music must be enhancing performance on this test. Because everything else is similar. They're sitting at the same types of computers. Okay, They're um, individuals drawn from the same population. And because you've randomly assigned them to these two conditions, there's nothing systematic that should differ between these two groups of people. So as far as you're concerned, you've isolated the only difference between these two groups being the fact that one of the groups, half of the people that is, heard this jazz music while they were studying the list, and the other half did not. Is that indeed the case in this situation? Can you think of any other potential confounding factors that might lead to differences if there is some sort of effect? So say the group that received the music is doing better, or let's say that the group receiving the music is in fact doing worse. Can you think of any other possible reasons why this might be the case? Let's think about one in particular. Okay? Now for example, look at exactly the way that you designed this study. You have a bunch of people sitting in a room, and then all of a sudden, once you tell them to start studying words, then if you look around and you're one of the people in this task and you see half of the people in the room putting on headphones and listening to music, that's going to potentially introduce some demand characteristics. You're going to see that they're experiencing something a little bit different than you're experiencing. What is it that they're listening to? Why are they getting music and I'm not? Oh, this must be a study that is looking at some manipulation that they're getting through the headphones. And all of a sudden it's starting to introduce a lot of baggage where there now is something very different going on in terms of the perceptions of these groups of people. Okay? Or look at another situation here. You have the people putting on the headphones at which point the music is starting. Well, that's not going to be an instantaneous process. It may take, sure, only 10 or 15 seconds to get the headphones on and start the music. But that's time where they're going to be focused and they're going to have an adjustment period in terms of trying to put on the headphones and listen to the music that's coming. And they're not going to be focused on studying the words. So in other words, the effective study period for those that are receiving the music may be slightly, albeit perhaps negligibly, shorter than those that aren't receiving the music. So these are just two examples of what are seemingly minor details that can potentially lead to influences that are going to compromise the inferential logic you might have in an experiment. Now what you might do is to think about how you could adjust the situation, that is how can you correct this experimental design to try and alleviate these potential confounds and get rid of them. What you might do is to test people in different rooms, those that are getting the music and those that are not. That way you don't see other people putting on the headphones. You might have them listen to the music before the study, study period begins. And that way you wouldn't have to worry about them adjusting to the, the sudden onset of music and some of these other things. So again, it's important to really think about some of these details and try and eliminate as many confounds that might creep into an experimental design. Now when we're talking about confounds and potentially compromising the uh, uh, experimental logic and inference that you're able to draw, what we're really talking about is a specific type of, of concept called internal validity. Now I know that we've talked about validity a little bit, especially in 293, and we're talking about some specific types of validity here, so it's important to make sure that we keep all of these straight. First of all, I'm not going to review them here, but you need to think back to 293 where we talked about different types of validity, construct validity, content validity, convergent validity, discriminant validity. These are all different types of measurement validity. In particular, what we mean by that is they were talking about the validity or accuracy or appropriateness of the construct that you were trying to measure. That is your measurement instrument itself. Okay? So how well did your survey measure the construct you were trying to measure? How could you assess this by comparing it to other known instruments of the same construct? How well can it predict the behaviors that it's supposed to be measuring? These types of things. So it's talking about how good of a measurement instrument you might have, like a survey or performance on the memory test in the previous example. But what we're talking about now are really two other different types of validity. The first is what we refer to as internal validity. And essentially all this really means is how sound indeed is this experimental logic. Okay? Formally, internal validity then is the extent to which the results of an experiment can indeed be attributed to the manipulation of the independent variable, that one thing that you have differing between the conditions, rather than to some other confounding variable.
Okay, so how sound is your experimental logic? That is what we mean by internal validity. And we're going to talk about in subsequent lectures here some of the specific things that might compromise this internal validity, some very specific confounds that might creep into different types of designs. Now that will by no means be exhaustive, but it gives you an idea of some of the things that we're talking about here, just like the examples that we came with in, in the music and studying example on the previous slides. Now contrasting internal validity is external validity. This is the extent to which the results of an experiment can be generalized beyond this specific experimental setting. So if I look at uh, um, the music example from the previous slide, how well do the results that I find there generalize to recall of other things besides word lists? What about recalling pictures? Well, what about other types of music? What if it wasn't jazz music we were listening to? Would classical music give the same effect? Would rock or hip-hop or country or any other type of music produce the same effect? Okay, so how well can you generalize beyond your exact experimental setting? And that can come in a few different forms. It might just say, well, what if I were to do the exact same experiment in the exact similar environment, exact same music, and exact same design parameters, would I get the same results? Okay, that would be a simple or a mere exact replication. And then you can think about, well, what if I change things? What if I change the music a little bit, or the age of the participants a little bit? or the list of words a little bit. Okay. Now I'm not going to go into all the different details or the different types, specific types of replication, but I do want you to refer and be familiar to those. They're on page 238 in chapter 9 in your textbook. Okay. And you can think about the value of these different types of replication as well. Now finally I want to talk a little bit about different experimental designs. Okay. Now we've done this somewhat in class and so I don't want to harp on it a lot right here. But I do want to talk about it a little bit as in terms of the way that it relates to these possible threats to internal validity. Now, no design is going to be perfect. Each is going to be susceptible to some potential confounds or some threats to internal validity. You can't necessarily control every little thing, and you can't have a perfect experiment. It just doesn't exist. However, depending on how severe each of the different threats is to a particular situation, you can determine which design might be preferred. And what I mean by that is, if you can think about what are uh, the, the most egregious threats to internal validity, what are the things that are going to introduce perhaps the most important or the most challenging confounds in a specific situation, and then you might want to get rid of those specific confounds by implementing a specific type of design. In particular, we've talked about three different types of designs, the between subjects design, the within subjects design, and the matched subjects design. Now this table, I'm not, again, I'm not going to go into detail because it, it's, it's copied from your book and so you can read it there as well. Okay, but if you look at in particular the strengths and weaknesses, and some of these that we've talked about in class as well, specific to um, some of these examples that we've gone over, then you can think about, well, if I'm in a situation where the most important thing here is to make sure that we don't have specific testing effects or demand characteristics, then you might want to avoid, for example, a within subjects design. If you think that potential fatigue might be a big problem for the type of design that you're, um, that you're looking at, then you might want to avoid a within subjects design knowing that having participants go through multiple conditions for the same participants, that is a repeated measure setting, is going to potentially make fatigue effects that much worse. So again then the point is then to think about what are probably some of the worst potential confounds that might be introduced in a situation and can you be savvy in terms of picking the right type of design or the best type of design that is going to minimize the confounds that are most likely to occur for your specific design or your specific situation. That actually concludes the introduction that I wanted to cover here for the material that's presented in Chapter 9. Now again, this doesn't exhaustively cover the material in Chapter 9, and it certainly doesn't complete the topic of threats to internal validity. What I want to do is to sort of set up the basic game plan, the basic foundation for talking about specific confounds, specific designs, and specific remedies that we can take both on the design side and on the analytic side to some of these challenges that we might encounter. Now there's not a quiz to take at the moment, but again, I hopefully you guys can retain the knowledge from this lecture and think about it, uh, if nothing else, as a lens by which you're viewing and, and engaging in some of the concepts we're going to cover in the subsequent lectures.